Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Saturday morning Bible study. It's April 30th, 2016, and um, Mike is the moderator, so take it away, Mike. Thank you very much. So the reading is from Miss Eleni, I mean, sorry, Miss Eleni, and uh, by Mary Baker Eddy. God has thrust in the sickle, and he is separating the tares from the wheat. This hour is molten in the furnace of soul. This harvest song is worldwide, world known, world great. The vine is bringing forth its fruit. The beams of right have healing in their light. The windows of heaven are sending forth their rays of reality. Even Christian science pouring out blessing for cursing and rehearsing. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out the blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. And I do believe that miscellany is a proper pronunciation. If you're, if you're in, English. In certain parts of the English. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what I am, so I guess I tried both. <laughs> right. Tomato, tomato. Okay. Before we start, Linda was going to mention something. Go ahead, Linda. Um, well, since we uh, had the little situation before the Bible study, too, we find these little things are popping up around the Bible study that are a little disruptive or not. Um, there seems to be opposition around the Bible study, and I would love to have people um, uh, pray some more with us as a group. And it, uh, it was very easy, and I know I did it myself, to kind of get relaxed and just see the wonderful part of it and just not think about also defending it. So I just uh, wanted to bring that to attention to people the last, um, like, five or six weeks. We don't take it for granted. And she's talking about getting the questions gathered together and, and getting them. Making mistakes. and Making mistakes. Losing yeah. things. Yeah. And things like that. So it should all go smoothly. But we can't take any process for granted. We pray through each each thing. So. Thank you. That's what I wanted to say. That was perfect. Thank you. Right. And that's appropriate for virtually every activity of the church, every service, the readings, the music. Every publication. Yeah. The publication. The round table. The round table. The Bible study. Everything should everything should be prayed over and that means prepare your thought and be ready to handle the opposition because the opposition will be there and if it's handled beforehand you might not actually even notice it because you've taken care of it ahead of time it's why we have our watches um, Tuesday night for Wednesday and Saturday night for the Sunday service but in those watches, you can certainly include our Bible study, publications, and other things. Everything to do with Christian science and getting the word out, the clear, correct teaching, as Yusuf said, of it. Not the bogus science, but the right sense of it. So, okay, go ahead, Mike. And I do have to say it was easy on my part to be so focused on getting questions, etc., that I personally didn't... Uh, even think about uh, working on this, uh, you know, everything being smooth, etc. So thank you for that reminder. Okay, the topic uh, today is the wheat and the tares, and that was from uh, Matthew 13. First question is, what was the importance of wheat to the people of Jesus' time? Well, to say a quote, bread is the staff of life, as we've heard. Um, but wheat was very important um, because when they were able to grow crops, that meant that they could stay in one place and not be hunters and gatherers. And, and um, it, it just was a, a way of um, forming that way of life. Yeah, I was con 
considered probably the most important staple in their diet. I read it was um, valued as as the divine provision for the people of God, and it was really the basis of human civilization in many parts of the world. It was it was about everything. And you think of all the um, products of wheat. You have flour, grain, beer, straw, and the straw they use, you know, for the animals. Uh, something highly important. Where's Jean? We haven't had Jean in a while. Jean, if you're listening, come back. <laughs> <laughs> she usually starts us off. I thought it was interesting that even 2,000 years before Christ that there were bakeries and shops where you could get bread. That is interesting. And, you know, I believe that bread had gluten in it. <laughs> Everybody seemed to survive for centuries. <laughs> and it tasted better with the gluten. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you have really dense bread. Right. That's right. It makes it a lot more lofty. Do you have anything to say about this, Mike? I do. Uh, um, in the study of it, it's uh, fascinating because uh, it came up with this place where it said that today about 20% of all human food is uh, based off of wheat. So it's still incredibly important today. And uh, also that one of the beauties of wheat is that it will grow in really, really harsh environments where uh, other staples like rice and corn can't thrive or even survive. For example, in Ireland, uh, they would uh, have these little interesting... Uh, uh, Kind of almost, they'd like create a cave where they would put the wheat and then below it they would build a fire to dry it because the climate was so wet there. So they developed ways of uh, using it in the really plate, uh, harsh places like that. And then uh, the Egyptian wheat had seven ears on it. Uh, so they would have seven uh, sprigs of the grain, which I thought was really fascinating. And then the other thing was that uh, the statement of a hundredfold was that one uh, plant in a good conditions, which was derived obviously from one grain of uh, wheat, uh, can produce a hundred grains of, uh, of uh, wheat when it comes to harvest. Isn't that interesting? Yes. I'm always amazed at how much I don't know when I come to Bible school. <laughs> so, so wheat multiplies a hundredfold. Isn't that right? Hundredfold? Exactly. Right. And it gives you a picture of a tender, loving God who's provided everything for our needs. Yeah. And here's wheat, a symbol of it. Provision for God's people. Because it seems like every... Probably everywhere, bread of some kind is used. Uh, yeah. All yes, over the and, world. Mm -hmm. And you see, not so much in America, but certainly in Europe, all, all the bakery stores selling fresh bread. It's a very nice concept. A lot of our breads <laughs> got so many. It's not fresh. <laughs> it's not fresh. No, it's got a lot of preservatives. But the fresh bread on the bakery corner of every street in Paris and other countries, other cities, uh, it is a staple, as is rice and corn, but wheat perhaps is the top one. last one I forgot to mention was that they think that, uh, over they is that uh, wheat, uh, as we know it today, originated in that region of the world. That, uh, Jesus came out of also, so that's kind of fascinating. That is. Any other yeah. things on the 
Bread of heaven. Bread of heaven. Bread of heaven. Bread of heaven. Any other points on the wheat? Oh, um, if I could just say something about wheat. Um, I love bread, and it is quite alarming to see how everyone is going gluten-free and that bread is being vilified. But there's a whole movement of farmers who are bringing back the original wheat that is much more nutritious, and and they're they're trying to bring back more nutritious and and beautiful whole wheat breads. And their claim is that the modern wheat has been so um, you know played with in the laboratories that that it doesn't resemble at, at all the wheat that was originally um, given to man on the planet. So. They're trying to bring back this old nutritious wheat where people don't have a gluten problem when they eat it. So I just always love um, the way nature intended, the way God intended. Um, before man goes into the laboratory and tries to improve upon it, sometimes the improvements are good, but most of the time they should just leave things alone. <laughs> yeah. Don't fix it if it's not broke. Really? That's right. <laughs> leave it to man to mess with something that comes back a hundredfold. <laughs> <laughs> I know I can get a hundred and one fold out of that. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I would like to make a comment on that because I really wasn't going to get into that part of it. But what's fascinating is that my wife... Uh, went to a course where they talked about the whole issue of gluten, so we tried being gluten-free here for a bit and then through experimentation uh, because she was having issues from breads. It actually turned out that uh, it wasn't the gluten at all because if I used organic flour, then she didn't have the issue, and that was wheat flour also. So it's uh, almost going over to the question of who sowed the tares, and the, it's where the blame gets assessed. So it might not be even gluten that's the issue with a lot of people. It might be other chemicals that are in there. And we know that what is naturally given to us of God is never the issue. It's always the human in perverting things. Yeah, perverting things and, and seeing uh, power in matter when it has no power. Powerless. Exactly. Beautiful. That was a wonderful point. Uh, any others, or shall we go on to the sure. water terrors? This is fascinating to me. They're a type of weed called the bearded darnel, and it was a species of ryegrass. And the seeds um, had a strong poison to them, which caused convulsions and death. But it, it was very similar looking to wheat until the ear appears, so that you can only dis discover the difference at that time. Interesting. Very interesting, yes. It also says that it, it tends, that poison tends to cause sleep. <laughs> so, oh well, sleep. <laughs> yeah, I use the word sulfurphoric in the definition. Yeah, sulfurphoric, mm -hmm. And what was your definition of that, Linda? I, I can't remember. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I do all that you know. It says causing sleep, tending to cause sleep, sleep. narcotic. Yes, hypnotic sleep. Hypnotic, dropping. that's what it was. It was hypnotic, mm -hmm. yeah. Blindness. Another term used is intoxicating. Yeah, but at I, first, I, it looked like the wheat. Isn't that interesting? That's tricky. You know, also, uh, the roots get intertwined, so you really have to be careful. You can't pull it out. That's it. Um, I read it, 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 the bad seed grows and causes problems and confusion um, because it does look just like the real thing. And th this is a huge, I mean, this is a huge point for a lot of reasons. 
um, I know probably those of you who read commentaries, you know, they compared wheat and tares. I mean, the story talks about the world and uh, the wheat being the, the good, righteous people and the tares being those who are not, who are being influenced by, quote, the devil. And, and you can't tell. You can't tell which is which. They have to grow up. You can't try to pull them out early on. But it does con uh, cause this confusion. Anyway, I didn't know all this about tares, and uh, maybe I'm getting into another question. But I have some things from miscellany to read too, but maybe not yet. But you can see how the era. I mean, it, it's so fascinating to me that that the tear is hypnotic sleep poison, drunkenness, even blindness, and as Elizabeth said, convulsions and even death. So what does that mean to us? Watch out. <laughs> and, well, and watch. And watch. Be on constant guard. Right, because when they first, when it first shows up, can you tell the difference? with your eyes or your nose or by feeling it? Or do you with the material sense that you can tell? No. You know, and not only that, when the seeds are sown before anything springs up, you don't even know it's there at all. Then when it springs up, you can't tell the difference. It's not until the harvest time that it can be separated. But. What do we know? What does science tells us about how to detect and when to detect it? That's future spiritual sense. So by what your eyes see or human belief tells you, the only way is human is your spiritual sense telling you something is wrong. You know, this is highly important now. Uh, well, well, we'll take it perhaps first with the world sense of it, but you know, all, all of this election business is going on. I mean, I, I have heard so many contradictory stories. Lies are being spread, and certainly the media fosters it, the media that's part of the tears, and they do it to ca cause confusion to cause the hatred, to cause rising up and, and arguing and fighting and the bad guys and the good guys. There's only one way. You've got to use your spiritual sense through this. The only way you're going to see yourself clear. I mean, there are a few times I've been appalled. I've heard one thing, and then I've heard what someone else says who, that's the person that they're talking about, and they said it's absolutely not true. It's a downright lie. So who are you going to believe, and how do you know? Only, only your spiritual sense can, can tell you. Now, that's only one example of what's going on right now, just one. But just about everything is in, the, in that category, and I'm highly suspicious of anything that I see on the news or read. You just don't know if it's the truth. This is why Mrs. Eddy had established the Christian Science Monitor. It was going on then. She talk, called it yellow journalism to influence your thinking. Erroneously. Erroneously, yes. Now, I'm going to read something. This is from Miss Delaney on 249. You may condemn evil in the abstract without harming anyone or your own moral sense, but condemn persons seldom, if ever. Improve every opportunity to correct sin through your own perfectness. When error strives to be heard above the truth, let the still small voice produce God's phenomena. Meet dispassionately the raging elements of individual hate and counteract its most gigantic falsities. The moral abandon of hating even one's enemies excludes goodness. Hate 
is moral idiocy let loose for one's own destruction. Unless withstood, that the heat of hate burns the wheat, bears the tares, and sends forth a mental miasma fatal to health, happiness, and the morals of mankind. And all this only to satiate its loathing of love and its revenge on the patience, silence, and lives of saints. The marvel is that at this enlightened period, a respectable newspaper should countenance such evil tendencies. Billions may know that I am the founder of Christian science. I alone know what that means. That could make you weep, but she is speaking of this in the lesson, and I wrote about it this morning on the forum. Uh, you know, it talks about hatred, but inflames the propensities. It, it, go, it goes out of control. And here it says it burns the wheat. Burns the wheat. Burns the wheat. And spares the tares. It That's is why it is so important me to do these uh, independent watches because it has really helped me in this, especially as you mentioned the election, um, the veil is lifting and when I do hear something from the press and I do hear something from a candidate, I certainly feel empowered to see the truth that is really being put out there and not to accept those lies. And it has been because of these um, unity watches. I'm so grateful for that. Thank you. No, it's absolutely right. This is the only answer to these times. And here, I mean, she's implying that this hatred was directed toward her and um, by newspapers, which it absolutely was. And still is. And still is. And still is. Out to destroy still and cause confusion. The internet can be used for great uh, good, but it can also be used to do, just be spreading these lies. And that is why the great good we must magnify. And that is why you all should be contributing, writing on the forum, writing on the bulletin board. There shouldn't be any lack of activity. It shows what when there is. What's happening? Sleeping. <laughs> tears, tears, <laughs> hypnotic sleep. <laughs> so. Maybe that's an introduction to question number three, huh? <laughs> Are we there yet? Are we there yet? One, yeah. one quick uh, item on the tears is that when they all come to feed the wheat, obviously, there's beautiful big grain, and the uh, hairs is actually a tiny, small black seed, so it's really very obvious at that point. There's no question which is which. And the other thing I want to say is that uh, I'm sure it could be done with every week and every study, but I was just very fascinated using the concordance to check out all Mrs. Eddy's uh, comments on wheat and tares, and it was quite a choice to choose the one for this uh, reading, but they're all wonderful. So thank you for sharing that one. You're welcome. Yes, Mike, and that's what I did do, and what you did was a beautiful one, too. And there are others we're going to talk about, and something that Jeremy found, too, that he wrote on the on the website, but uh, on the forum. Great. Great. Oh. Any any more on those terrors? Or uh, that no, one would be well like covered. Say, I'd like to say one thing. I, I saw that uh, Roman law prohibited sowing the Darnell among the wheat of an enemy. I thought it was interesting that it was like an old form of biological weapon. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And, and I also read that it grows plentifully in Syria and Palestine. So, but who knew? I didn't know all this till till you know, we have this Bible study. I always, I knew the story, but I didn't ever go into it like we are, which is so helpful. So, 
watch out for the tears. Well, that actually has incredible ramifications because one of the interesting things is that for the uh, genetically modified seeds, I could never quite figure out when I was farming many years ago why it was such a big issue. And then uh, now I finally understand that uh, with the soybeans, to use an example, when they cross-pollinate, you can track those genes at that level. So if one farmer has his own seed that he's used for 200 years and these genetically modified seeds are planted next door and they cross-pollinate, they microscopically or however they look at genes, the, the farmers Soybeans, they're contaminated. So to me, it's amazing that the Romans understood how evil this was and that it was such a. It was outlawed at that time because it should be outlawed today because the whole thing was uh, genetically modified to me as a control thing, not necessarily making a better product. It's more of now we can uh, control all the seeds in the world through this. Thank you. No, that's that's very true, and that if it is an atrocious thing, I've heard of that, and and that the the farmers can't do anything about it when that happens. They have no no protection. Um, so I mean, we we try not to make big deals about what we eat because we're told take no thought for what you eat put on, but same time we do use wisdom and when possible, the simple organic foods that are, this is Eddie ate, <laughs> Jesus ate, that were intended, that God produced, I'm sure, the, the best. God's provision, God's blessing, not what man has recreated. Okay. Number three. Who slept and why was that an issue? I think we've already started on that one, so that should be easy to finish. Oh, what came to me yes, from uh, reading time. Yes, Go ahead. The men slept. And it was in their sleep that they allowed the enemy to plant the seeds. <clears throat> so what does it mean to sleep? They weren't alert. What does that mean? They didn't watch. That's right. I mean, were their eyes closed? They're in the human mind. They're thinking in the human mind. Bingo. To be asleep means to be in the human mind. Your eyes can be wide open and you can still be fast asleep. Carnal mind is at enmity with God, the Bible says. When you're in that mind, you don't get things. And you can be you can you can be a walking zombie and don't you see it sometimes people are walking around and look like zombies it's also clear that this is the intent of evil is to get people into a daze therefore it can come in and do as it wishes without being opposed that's how it works you know that that's how someone like hitler could have gotten into power they were all mesmerized. They were in a daze. They were sleeping. They didn't even get it, except for those who were awake, and there were those who were awake. Believe me, they were. But things had gotten so far that they were unable to stop it until the very end. So this is why we walk through this on this earth circumspectly, with our eyes front of us and in back of us and on all the sides, <laughs> watching and praying. It was said, Mrs. Eddy knew, uh, the needs of the world. 
she could feel it, and she would work on it and pray. And as I, we have said, we never will know how many things she uh, forestalled. She forestalled or completely stopped through her prayers and through the students' prayers in her home. That's why this idea of the, the watches stopping is appalling, and not people even knowing about them. Well, one of the things that uh, Adolf Hitler did was, uh, or his people, is that they did a lot of hypnosis. Yes. People were not only asleep, there was a problem of mesmerism. Thank you. Absolutely there was. And the word he had a, he had a head of the a propaganda, verbal, and they, they told lies. They told lies and they got people to believe the lies. And now it's common practice in a lot of different countries. Politicians are well trained in how to tell lies and get people to believe them. You know, we used to go to this Cuban restaurant and the, the owner of there was Cuban and he told us that when he lived in Cuba, um, he heard terrible things about the United States. He thought we were a terrible, terrible country. That was the propaganda. And then one time, I, I think maybe he was working on a cruise ship or something, and he ended up that he got off in the United States. He said, goodness, this isn't anything that I've been told. <laughs> and I think he refused to get back on the boat, and he stayed here. And, and uh, I guess they couldn't get him, but it was just quite an interesting story of being so duped. All this hatred, where do you think that's generated? People are told lies. They're told lies. These are the tears. And that is the basis of Islam, for example. I mean, it's not the only yeah. form that it takes. And they start with the children. Telling the children lies. You know, people are good. People, we love each other. We're not terrible, mean people. No, nobody anywhere is. But this is the, the Satan. What's causing sleep, lies, it's the Adam dream, and we must always come back to the fact that it is not real. It is as if you are watching someone asleep or on stage who is hypnotized and is doing all kinds of weird things um, because they are hypnotized, and you wake them up. And that's how you take care of a situation, by waking them up. But this is a hugely and a highly important uh, subject. The other thing, I mean, one of the commentaries I read said that oh, one way of looking at it, too, is that the devil, quote, the devil, unquote, works at night. So what does that mean? It works in darkness and night. Mm -hmm. in darkness. So you can't be seen. Yes. Mm -hmm. It works when people are asleep. Again, whether their eyes are open or closed doesn't really matter. Looks for an opportunity where people have relaxed their alertness. So it's like the word occult means hidden. Hidden. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And this is this is a different point than being asleep. Hidden is something else, and that's why when you uh, don't want to get a truth out or you don't want to tell somebody that there's something bothering you. You're personalizing an error to your bosom. You're holding it to your bosom. You've got to get it out. You've got to get it out so it is no longer hidden. Once it's exposed, it will be destroyed, as Mrs. Eddy says. So, yes, error likes to hide, hide, hidden, in secret. Why don't, if anyone ever tells you don't tell anybody this. That's when you get up on your rooftop and start shouting it to everyone in town. No secrets, nothing hidden. How the, that's how the devil works. And that's, what, that's how error thrives, or appears to. Yes. So, again, is why we do what we do week after week after week, not just for two weeks a year, but week after week to keep everybody awake and alert and handling these things. And that's why it is absolutely essential 
as anyone ever begins to study Christian science, that they learn to trust their spiritual sense. Because your spiritual sense is never wrong. But how many of us always trust our spiritual sense? Not always easy, is it? Well, first you must cultivate the spiritual sense by staying in the right mind or making the effort to stay in the right mind. I don't think just reading the lesson you know, and thinking you're in the spiritual mind does it. <clears throat> oh, that's absolutely right, Warren. This, this is a mental discipline. It requires mentally disciplining ourselves. As we go through the day and stuff comes to us, stay in the right mind. And to practice hearing God's voice by using it. As as Lauren said, you cultivate it. You 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 realize it's there and you listen for it. Studying helps get you to where you can do it, but studying is, is not doing it. Obeying God when crap comes to you is what does it. And realizing when you don't obey, then it's really bad. I think about those men. I, I figure one season of sorting through the wheat and the tares is probably all they needed. <laughs> They're going to be watching <laughs> after that. So. Well, hopefully. Hopefully, right. And this is, this is from Mrs. Eddy's article on obedience, 117. The student of Christian science must first separate the tares from the wheat, discerned between the thought motive and act superinduced by the wrong motive or the true. The God-given intent and volition arrest the former and obey the latter. This will place him on the safe side of practice. We always know where to look for the real scientists and always find him there. I agree with the Reverend Dr. Talmadge that there are wit, humor, and enduring vivacity among God's people. So, you won't find a real Christian scientist looking dopey or mesmerized. We used to joke we could tell them a mile away because that is how they would look. The, the ones in the culture. We should have a good sense of humor. We should be real. We shouldn't be all weird. And we, and we should approach these challenges with a positive attitude. And, you know, here, Mrs. Eddy, and this is always a good thing to ask when you're not sure about something or not sure about someone, maybe. What's, what's the motive? What is behind what they're doing? If their motive is self or money or con even confusion, hate, well, then, of course, you know it's wrong. They're standing up for principle. If what they're doing is unselfed, then, it, of course, it's right. And, of course, that goes back to you as well. What is your motive? Motives are great indications of a lot. And that's what this is. That's how it helps separating the tears from the weeds. Check your motives. Now, as I mentioned, in some of the commentaries that, yeah, they talk about the world, the tares and the wheat growing in the world, and they talk about churches, you know, that you're growing side by side. Sometimes it's hard to tell who's, who's the real prophet and the false prophet. And then what does Mrs. Eddy say? Read what you have. Jeremy. You are growing. The Father has sealed you, and the opening of these seals must not surprise you. The character of Christ is wrought out in our lives by just such processes. The tares and wheat appear to grow together until the harvest. Then the tares are first gathered. That is, you have seasons of seeing your errors. And afterward, by reason of this very seeing, the tares are burned. The error is destroyed. When you see truth plainly and the wheat is gathered into barns, it becomes permanent in the understanding. 
the healing will grow more easy and be more immediate as you realize that God good is all and good is love. You must gain love and lose the false sense of love. You must feel the love that never faileth, that perfect sense of divine power that makes healing no longer power but grace. Then you will have the love that casts out fear, and when fear is gone, doubt is gone, and your work is done. Why? Because it was never undone. Oh, that, that is beautiful. Where did you find that? Oh, that's uh, Course in Divinity and General Cortania, which is also called the Blue Book, page 127. Excellent. And that brings it all home to us. Not the world or the church, but us. So maybe next we'll go to the next question because it applies. just want to make one quick comment, that, uh, and this is also an advertisement for those who haven't done a moderated a Bible study yet, and that's that you don't have to have the answers to the questions, because uh, after who slept, I thought that was kind of a rather basic and foolish, it's always the servants, but then reading commentaries, it suggests that it's not only servants, but the people that are in charge of our uh, nations, uh, our churches and institutions, because they're all so sleeping, because they're not... Uh, doing what is moral and correct. Thank you. And uh, I also have to say that we do know what Mrs. Eddie Swatches did, because it occurred to me listening to the, listening to the discussion, there were world uh, skirmishes around the world, the Spanish-American War, Sino-Russian uh, uh, War, et cetera, et cetera. But after Mrs. Eddie's passing, uh, very shortly thereafter, we went through a phase of world wars, so I think it's quite evident what she presented, now that I see it. Well, that's true. But there are many things, too, we don't know. But right, that exactly. There are many right. we do. And, and yeah, absolutely, right. World War One, World War II, uh, well, quite a few things. We went up the gold standard. We became, got into the taxing, right. income, income tax. tax Federal, yeah. Reserve. Federal Reserve. We legalized stealing, all that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Wait. sorry to laugh about that. <laughs> well, okay, okay. Mo moving on. Yes, uh, uh, number four. Why did the servants question what seeds were sown? And uh, one should probably say, and who sowed the seeds? Well, the servants had a little bit of spiritual sense, didn't they? I think the servants wanted to be sure that it was it was only that the he knew it was only good seed that went in, and it wasn't you know some impurity in there. To go along with that, um, I read that long ago there were groups of women who were supposed to separate the, uh, the, the tares because they were slate and gray in color, and you could discern them in the beginning if you caught it fast enough. And so, you, like you said, that the, the servants knew that only good seed had gone into the ground. Uh, that's and yet, interesting. And yet they saw the tears and saw the difference. Yeah. And that's interesting. I, didn't, I hadn't read that. You could catch it early on. So what does that mean? That's what we have to do. Yes. You stay alert, you would. Exactly. When you will. And the more you develop your spiritual sense, the more you will catch it early on before it grows up, and then it's much harder. Be with thine adversary quickly while on the way. Yes. And be so instant in truth, era is always too late. Too late. Steady. So, yeah, I mean, the servants, to some degree, were more awake than others. They were watching, anyway, watching the situation. At least they noticed. Maybe they noticed after they woke up what, was, what had gone on. 
Hopefully we all do that when we wake up. See what's gone on and how you've been hoodwinked or deceived in some way. Also, if the uh, servants were not awakened at that point, or if they wanted to shift the blame and because they were slothful, it was a way of actually accusing the Christ idea of uh, having given them bad seed. When, if even if there had been one seed of contamination, they could have picked it out because it is so different. Right. And you know what? What is that expression? One one rotten apple spoils the bunch. That's why you have to be careful with that, and with contamination, and and with wrong thought that enters. It it has to be corrected in your own thinking, and when it enters a group, poisonous. Well, he realizes. Sorry, go ahead. The other thing I read I thought was interesting is that the, the devil didn't put the uh, tears. In with other tears, where did he put it? Went after the good <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, he went <laughs> after the good stuff. Mm-hmm. Yes, he went after the good stuff to, to ruin the good stuff. I read that the enemy is uh, opposition to the Christ. Thank you. And, that, and it well, that's is. What, always is. It's whatever takes your thought away from Christ is your enemy. That's, 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 says that. that's a very good, simple definition of it, of our enemy. The Antichrist. And I realize that's why I was an atheist for most of my life, was because I believed all the lies about God and about uh, Christ. Right. And you wanted, you wanted nothing to do with the wise. Exactly. To your credit. Until you but find it also, it also goes to show that I was so asleep. I mean, many years of picking through the right and wrong and farm organizations and in politics and everything, it still took me another 20 years to figure out that... Uh, Everything that I knew about uh, God and Christ was an absolute lie. I mean, I knew nothing good about him. I mean, I, I just think I'm sitting here totally dumbfounded that I could be so, so uh, dense, I guess. Well, but that's part of the answer to the next question, isn't it? Yes. Certainly leads into Doesn't the Doesn't that next. help explain? And what is the next question? Why wait until the harvest time to separate the tares from the wheat? What is the harvest time? Is it? Mike just explained it. it took him a while. Yeah. And it can't be done humanly. One thing to see right and wrong and try and get your human ambition going in there and try and make it right and fix it. But in the meantime, you do more damage than good. There's a divine way of separating. Let God guide you. He will. That is so true. When you're Thank ready. You. Yes, when you're ready. You know, in my own experience, I hung, I hung on so tightly to human goodness. I didn't see that as a tear. Took me a while. I was never thrown out of church or anything. Well, not at least too often. (laughs) (laughs) We won't go there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it it just, and if you think of yourself and, and have patience with yourself, because some things you just don't get at first. I mean, I hear people upset that they don't get things or, you know, they're just not getting it or, well, you be patient with yourself and, and it is God working. You're not forcing willfully trying to change yourself. 
Because what, I mean, after all, what is the harvest of time? Uh, you know, here in Kansas, we grow a lot of wheat, and they tell the harvest time. It, it's just the fullness of the ears, and they can tell the farmers here. Uh, and then they have to make every, sure that there is not moisture content before they get the combines out and, and, and you know, and gather it. And you, you can't do it when it's raining or anything like that. You have the moisture content is a very good indication when to harvest. So what does this mean for us? What is the harvest time being referred to here? You almost have to have a word from God. You have to know. It's, it, it's almost like an instinct. The farmers have developed that through uh, generations and generations. They know when the harvest time is. Right, right. But stop farming. Okay. We're not talking about farming now. No, is, I know we are not, but I was helping. This is terrible. Hoping that, thank, <laughs> thank you. But what does this parable mean to us? What is the harvest time? has to be a word from God, doesn't it? Let's prove all things and all that. good. It's when I demonstrate science. I mean, it, 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 is this a big worldwide event that all happens at once? No. No. Everybody in oh, the no. past. No. No, this is each individual's harvest time. It goes on some degree continually. What was the hymn that was quoted in the watch about the divine event? No, the one divine event is here and now, and that event is love. So I, I like the idea that it's a continual process. I think in my own life experience, you know, I can look back and see specific events and things that are happening, points of growth, etc. But it's always an ongoing process. It's not like one thing, it's done, and then it's all over. It's going. And, you know, you'll have day, days of reckoning. You'll get, oh, wow, it'll be something you're struggling with for a long time, like in my case, that human goodness. Suddenly, I got, oh, wow, I get it. I see it. Sometimes it oh. takes a bit to hang on to it. Or, find, you know, harvest times, you see clearly, this has been an error all this time, and you didn't see it then. Right. A yeah, false we have, belief dropping away. Every time you firmly demonstrate a truth and the light bulb goes on and you say, oh, yeah, this is what, this is what God is telling me about whatever. And I will never believe this wrong belief again. Every time you catch a truth that nobody can ever take away from you because you've proven it, you've harvested something. Taken a step into the kingdom of heaven. But it's when you prove it for yourself. And then you realize, too, as Jeremy read, that it was never undone. You've always been a child of God. You're just awakening to that fact. Now, the truth is constantly unfolding to us. We just have to stop and pause and listen. Yes. Who's ready to hear it? It's always coming. And, and what, does, what does Jesus say about the harvest? Fields are white. Harvest is plenty. Oh. Plenty is. But what? The laborers are few. Yeah. <laughs> we all have to wake up. Yeah. Well, there's work for each one to do. There's, a, there's always something to do. Go ahead, Florence. Didn't she also say it's not in four months or how many months to come? Right. That's right. What does he say? Right here. Right here. Right here. As is the kingdom of heaven, not low there, low here, but within you. 
And, and I think it's, it's masterful that Mrs. Eddy, uh, all these other commentaries were talking about, you know, the tears and the weed with the world or the church, but she brings it absolutely home as for, with what Jeremy read. It's within you. What tears are you growing? What, and, and have, what, what has put you to sleep or blinded you? Or why are you soporific to some tears? Because that's what they've done. They've poisoned you so you don't see it. And if, and if you continue, especially if you allow hate, what she says is if you allow hate that fans those brutal propensities, and it will destroy you. Those were the things that I read from Zetti. Those are the, the tears that you have allowed, and they burn up the wheat, the good in you, in so and belief. And you know darn well from your own experience that that is true. It can be all-consuming once you start hating. You know, another uh, definition that I read in the commentary for enemy was competitor. That's why competition is so bad. You start comparing and competing, and that hate comes in, and you... You want to be better than somebody else. All the human mind is all very, very bad. The good work for the enemy, competitor. See all this arguing and fighting going on in the election, competitors, so-called. Right. Only competing is done as you do with yourself. Do the best you can, be the best you can. And science lived and demonstrated, truth lived and demonstrated, as Mrs. Eddy says, is what separates the tears from the wheat. And that is what burns the tears. Science is clearly lets you out of the darkness. That tear is gone forever. Yeah, Mrs. Eddy says in miscellaneous writing, page 111, leaving the seed of truth to its own vitality, it propagates, and the tares cannot hinder it. Leaving the seed of truth to its own vitality. And isn't that the fundamental premise of our Constitution? as just one application of that divine idea. That everybody's relationship with God is the most sacred relationship in a nation. The human right mind has no right to interfere with that. That's why Christian science was discovered and founded in the United States of America. It couldn't have been founded anywhere else in the world. So, are we in the last question? I wanted to just say a quick one here that in Genesis 1, God said, uh, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters, which is firmament is a division, the line of demarcation, line of demonstration that divides the wheat from the tares. So that's right there in Genesis 1. Um, okay. Number six. What does this and the other parables of Matthew 13 teach us about the kingdom of heaven? Well, we're at, a, at 11 o'clock, so I think we can just perhaps briefly sum up what this parable teaches us. I don't know whether we should get into any others. But. Well, one thing, there's a common thread between them all, and I got that this common sense of heaven as being some sleepy place of wonderful perfectionist is the wrong sense of heaven. Heaven is an active thing the separating of truth from error, awake and alert. 
No sleep in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, yeah. I think that really sums it up. Okay. This has been very good. Yes, excellent. Uh, thank you, everyone. Great yeah, question. Thank you, Great all. Class. Thank you, Mike, for... Who knew thank there was Mike. that much in this simple parable? <laughs> thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you all the money. Thank you. 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 Thank